used to say that there is no such thing as a free lunch. He was, of course, correct in saying that, because when a business associate invites you or I out to a meal, uh, the expectation usually is that we will uh, respond by uh, making sure that the particular request they have that accompanies the meal is fulfilled. They will expect a favour uh, from us. We have other similar statements that we sometimes make, don't we? We speak about getting uh, value for money and assuming that uh, only if we pay uh, more than we might pay in another supermarket, for example, that we will get the quality of goods uh, that we would prefer for ourselves. My wife and I had a friend when we lived in the West Country who used to visit up often, a visit often at quite considerable expense, uh, London in order to do her shopping and when she went to London she would go to Harrods uh, because Harrods was value for money uh, one has little doubt that in fact she could have got exactly what she was looking for at considerably a less expense and endeavour uh, closer to home uh, there are certain professions too who charge large fees uh, when those fees are examined they do not normally or often cover work that we would otherwise think uh, might justify those fees but the profession uh, likes to uh, charge high fees to give the impression that the quality of service that is being given the specialism the professionalism is one that deser deserves such payment there are not a few conferences that I have got invited to over the years, Christian conferences, uh, in which I would have had to have paid uh, a conference fee, perhaps a quite a large conference fee, in order to accommodate the costs of the speaker uh, who might well be travelling the world uh, to speak on a particular subject. Sometimes uh, one would have to say, it might appear that for all their huge fees that some of us could have done as good a job uh, for nothing. Now, uh, in Paul's world, there were no great uh, film stars. The people who were the superstars of the day were the people who were good speakers. And people would travel from place to place and charge large fees in order that people could uh, marvel uh, in their ability to speak and people would spend vast sums of money in order to equip themselves to be competent uh, speakers. It was one of the ways of getting on the equivalent of Hello Ma magazine's uh, front page in the first century. And that helps us get some idea of the background to the passage we're looking at this morning uh, in 2 Corinthians 11, chapter 7 uh, to 15. Uh, Paul speaks of the charge that had been made against him that he was lowering himself. Uh, he was lowering himself because in the views of uh, the, his opponents uh, he was not charging a sufficient fee. Uh, indeed, in Paul's world, as indeed in our world to some degree. The distinction between what we might call white-collar and blue-collar was one that was firmly uh, fixed, and the white-collar workers looked down on the blue-collar workers. Uh, those who undertook manual tasks were somehow inferior to the rest of humanity. And Paul sometimes worked for a living in order to sponsor his evangelistic uh, endeavours. Now, when Paul had come to Corinth, he'd been sponsored at least in part by churches uh, whom he had, as he says in verse uh, 8 and 9, robbed in order to minister at Corinth free of charge. Now, he doesn't mean he literally robbed them, uh, but he took the resources that they supplied to him, often at great cost for them to themselves, in order that he might undertake the ministry in Corinth. And it appears that it was his stated policy never to expect support in his evangelistic duties from those he was seeking 
to reach. He was ready to take support from those he had reached and who now grateful that he had brought the gospel to them were now keen that that same message be proclaimed elsewhere. But he did not charge for his preaching. The gospel uh, for him was a message of God's free grace and Paul was not going to charge for it. Uh, Indeed, as Paul reminds uh, his readers in this passage, uh, the gospel being the gospel of God's love is not subject to financial arrangement. The Beatles used to sing the song, Money Can't Buy Me Love, and they're right. We cannot buy love. Love is something free, freely given and freely received. And that dictated Paul's practice in preaching. When he went out on an evangelistic tour, uh, he went with the support of those who he had already reached, but he went to speak uh, and to preach freely, and sometimes if the resources that he'd been sent with were inadequate, he himself would resort uh, to working with his hands. Now that was very different from the practice of what Paul calls the super apostles. They were leeches. Uh, who used cultural norms to criticise Paul. You can catch something of that in verse 7. Was it a sin for me to lower myself in order to elevate you by preaching the gospel of God to you free of charge? You see, they would come along and say, you can't think much of Paul's ministry. Or you should think more of ours. Because, look, he charges nothing. And we uh, can charge large fees. And they hoped to shame Paul uh, into following their practice, because after all they were in it for the money. But Paul says, verse 12, I will keep on doing what I am doing in order to cut the ground from under those who want an opportunity to be considered equal with us in the things they boast about. And Paul's reply in what follows is brutal, but brutally true. Look what he says in verse 13 and following. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, masquerading as apostles of Christ. And no wonder for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising then if his servants masquerade as servants of righteousness, their end will be what their actions deserve. Now Paul recognised the need for adequate support, of course he did, but he was clear that where Christian ministry is undertaken for self-advancement, it is not Christian ministry. Those driven to make the ministry a channel for their own personal accumulation of fame and fortune are imposters. They may use spiritual language, but the spiritual language covers over their worldly values. And their language is a deliberate and considered attempt to deceive others by advance in and advance themselves. And what Paul says here is, as in this way they betray their spiritual lineage, even while seeking to clothe themselves in the garb of genuine Christians. They may look the part, uh, but they are revealed to be those who are children, not of God, but of the devil. Now that's what Paul is teaching here. It's the context in which he is addressing uh, his words. So what are we to learn from all this? Well, at the most basic level, what Paul wants the Corinthians to learn, and us to learn too, uh, is that we are not to be deceived by appearances. We're not to be deceived by appearances. The devil can masquerade as an angel of light and his servants can masquerade as the servants of light. Uh, But when the surface is scratched, when the underneath is revealed, they are seen to be utter deceivers. And as we continue in these studies in the following weeks, we will see uh, the, the consequences of such deception. So the bearing, the language, everything may seem right as we meet others who claim to be Christians. But what lies just beneath the surface? 
What values shape such person's actions? Whose children are they? But you know, it seems to me as we close that there is a far profounder application to this passage than simply we are to watch out that we are not deceived. Uh, And that application is that we need to be watchful that we ourselves are not deceivers or self-deceived. Whose children are we? What motivates and drives us? The Apostle Paul makes it very clear here that if we're driven by a desire for money, for fame, for power, if that is our driving force, as it was with these super apostles, uh, then we are children of the devil, not children of God. And how easily, as fallen human beings, uh, we slip into such attitudes, and conduct we need to guard our hearts if we're to be children of God we're to be those who are are watchful that we we ourselves are not deceived and we do not go out and become deceivers the church is full I don't mean just uh, this church indeed I would suggest it's not markedly true of us but the church is full the worldwide church is full of those Uh, who are primarily interested in their own self-advancement. They're in Christian ministry, they're in Christian work, uh, they are involved in the life of the church and local churches not to serve Christ, not to honour him, not because they are driven by attitudes that come from the Spirit of God, but they're driven by their desire for power can be as small a thing as power in the Sunday school. Uh, it can be a power over a nation or a nation church. Driven by power. Uh, driven by money. Driven uh, by these various things that are characteristic of the fallen world but are not to be characteristic of the church. And therein lies the challenge in this passage once again. As I've said on a number of occasions, uh, in this letter Paul is addressing very particular situations, a particular problem in the life of a church that uh, was there 2,000 years ago. But underneath what he says, Paul reveals here as perhaps nowhere else the manner uh, and the character of a true and genuine Christian spirituality as well as its counterfeit. Uh, And he invites us to challenge our own hearts as to ask, and to ask, whose are we? Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, this passage is a great challenge to us. Uh, It brings home to us uh, the values that once characterised us before we knew the Lord Jesus. And sometimes we regretfully acknowledge characterise us now may we not be those who are driven by personal ambition for power or money or fame or whatever it might be but are driven alone by a longing to see God glorified in us uh, in our church in our community and in our world help us to take your words this morning we pray and apply them to our own hearts for Jesus sake Amen.